Okay, good morning. Welcome everyone to today's nine o'clock briefing, which features embargoed research from three studies in the journal Science. The research papers to be discussed this morning are the geology and geophysics of Kuiper Belt object Arrokoff, color composition and thermal environment of Kuiper Belt object Arrokoff, the solar nebula origin of Arrokoff, a primordial contact binary in the Kuiper Belt. The speakers on our briefing this morning are Alan Stern, New Horizons Principal Investigator, the Southwest Research Institute, William McKinnon, New Horizons Geology and Geophysics Investigation Theme Team Deputy Lead at Washington University, Will Grundy, New Horizons Composition Science Theme Team Lead at Lowell Observatory, and John Spencer, New Horizons Deputy Project Scientist at the Southwest Research Institute. A reminder that all research discussed today is embargoed until 11 a.m. Pacific time or 2 p.m. Eastern time, so we appreciate no one tweeting about the content as we discuss it today. We will have a Q&A after the speaker's uh, opening remarks, and I would ask you to please let them leave the room at 945 so that we can set up for the next briefing, but we will have a follow-up room for questions. And now our first speaker, Dr. Stern. Thank you, Megan. Um, on behalf of the entire New Horizons team, uh, I want to tell you that we're here to talk about some very exciting, very important, uh, and I think very decisive results that teach us about the earliest stages of planet formation. And this is all due to the exploration of the Kuiper Belt Arakoff by uh, the New Horizons mission, which is, of course, a NASA mission. Um, Myself and, uh, and my colleagues here at the DS are all from the New Horizons team. I also want to point out to Dr. Ann Verbisher from the University of Virginia, who is another co-investigator, is also here, and she'll be available for uh, uh, the informal Q&A um, following at uh, 945. So with no further ado, uh, let me jump in. You already know who I am. So we, this is, I want to give you a little bit of background, and then Bill and Will and John are going to uh, talk about the central result that comes out of these three papers, uh, which will be uh, uh, published in Science today. Uh, and they are the lead authors of the, of the papers. Um, this is the New Horizons spacecraft in a photograph made in late 2005 in Florida uh, when the spacecraft was being prepared for launch. It's, as you can see, it's a very small spacecraft, uh, yet it's a very capable spacecraft with a very sophisticated set of imagers and spectrometers and other uh, scientific instruments on board uh, with much greater capability than we have ever sent uh, into the deep outer solar system before. The mission of New Horizons is to explore what we call the third zone of our solar system. So just stepping back a little bit, the architecture of our solar system is that in close to the sun there are four rocky planets we call the terrestrials, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. Then there's an asteroid belt. And then four uh, giant planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And beyond Neptune lies the Kuiper belt, this third zone of the solar system. Uh, this is where Pluto and many uh, other icy dwarf planets reside. But for our purposes today, uh, uh, it is, it is the best preserved region of the solar system for understanding origins, for understanding how uh, the solar nebula came to form the building blocks of planets that we call planetesimals, and then from the planetesimals, the planets themselves. Our spacecraft was launched, as you can see there, in January of 2006. Uh, it flew a very quick 13-month uh, trajectory to fly by Jupiter as both a flight test and uh, for a gravity assist. And then crossed the great gulf of the middle solar system during the succeeding years to encounter the Pluto system in uh, the middle of 2015. And that flyby, as all of you know, uh, was extremely successful and really revolutionized our knowledge, uh, not just about Pluto and its system of five moons, but also about uh, dwarf planets in general, but that's not the topic of our uh, news for you today. After New Horizons completed its job in the Pluto system, uh, it then undertook the next part of the mission that had been planned ever since 
the first planetary decadal survey recommended this mission as top priority for uh, the planetary science field. Uh, this region, the Kuiper Belt, has uh, uh, some unique characteristics that make it uh, the equivalent of an archaeological dig into the history of our solar system. And so we went purpose-built to study these small Kuiper Belt objects and to see what they could tell us, not just about Kuiper Belt objects, because we have an interest in them as constituents, important constituents of our solar system, but additionally to see what they could tell us about planetary formation. And uh, what Erikoth revealed um, was beyond my wildest expectations. So let me advance to the next slide. And I'm, yeah, okay, so this should be familiar to all of you, uh, Pluto, uh, which as I said, we explored in 2015. Um, if I click this again, you're gonna see an animation that zooms up onto the surface of Pluto and then places the Kuiper Belt, Erikoth, Kuiper Belt object, Erikoth, um, on Pluto's surface for scale. Now, for reference, uh, the distance across Pluto's diameter is uh, about the distance from the Denver area where I live to the U.S. East Coast. So it's quite a lar large object. But let's zoom in down onto those mountain blocks on Pluto, and there's little Erikoff, <laughs> which is about the size of Seattle, where we are now. Uh, and so, of course, this made a much more challenging technical feat to chase this object down, in fact, to discover it, and then to chase it down and do a flyby of it. Um, but that flyby, which was conducted on New Year's Eve and New Year's Day as it turned 2019, just over a year ago, uh, was completely successful. And here's Erikoth. Here is uh, our Kuiper Belt object target, or at least our first one. And you'll hear a lot more about it, but I just want to point out that you'll notice that most distinctively it has two lobes. The, uh, an upper lobe, which is smaller, and a lower lobe, uh, which is larger, as depicted in this image. Because the, this binary object doesn't consist of two objects orbiting one another, but in contact, we refer to it as a contact binary. Um, and uh, uh, my colleagues will speak to many of the aspects of this contact binary and why they're important for understanding origins. But what I want to do is compare this object to some others typical members that we have explored by spacecraft. Now, you will notice the scale bars are different. We have depicted the objects with the same size on the slide, but they're actually widely varying. Um, on your right is uh, Comet 67P, which the Ro ESA Rosetta spacecraft orbited for several years. It is tiny compared to Erikoth. Uh, you can see how much bigger the scale bar is because we zoom the object up. Uh, uh, Erikoff probably has something of order a thousand times the volume and mass of that comet. Uh, but we wanted you to be able to see it in detail. And then in the middle is the asteroid Ida, which the spacecraft Galileo explored. And what we want you to notice about both Ida, the surfaces of Ida and Comet CG, is how evolved they look. Uh, comets and asteroids uh, that we explore with spacecraft are explored uh, very close to the sun, where the heating is very intense, and uh, the collisional environment is also very intense, and the particle radiation is very intense, and all of these uh, and other factors cause these bodies, uh, while they're still very valuable for planetary science, to evolve rapidly. And in contrast, the objects in the Kuiper belt, four plus billion miles from the sun, where temperatures are only 30 or 40 degrees centigrade above absolute zero, 30 or 40 Kelvin, and where the collisional environment is uh, orders of magnitude less intense than in the asteroid belt, and the radiation environment is down as well. These Kuiper belt objects are, uh, for these reasons, uh, a far better preserved sample or window back into the formation stage of uh, planetesimals and then planets. And Erikoth is what we in our field would call a planetesimal. And it's the first completely primordial planetesimal that's ever been explored by spacecraft. The story that we're about to tell you uh, resolves a long-standing uh, quandary in how planetesimals formed and therefore in the earliest stages of planetary gestation. Uh, and with that, uh, I'm gonna introduce uh, Bill McKinnon to take it from there. 
So. Good morning, everyone. So the, the, the question, as Alan just uh, uh, introduced, is how do planetesimals, the building blocks of planets, form? And uh, the story then starts back at the very earliest part times of the solar system, where we have the young sun surrounded by a great disk of dust and gas rotating. Uh, this structure that you see in, in, in the cartoon is the size of the solar system, so it's an, it, and it matches the kind of things we see out in space around other young stars in, in our, our telescopic surveys. But if we zoom in, and this complicated bit of slide, so the solar disk, the protosolar disk is over on the left there, the little white line starts at a particular spot. We basically, there are two, two dominant theories for how planetesimals form. The top line introduces what was the dominant theory throughout basically the entire 20th century, which we can call hierarchical accretion. And it's a very simple idea. It's what I was taught when I was in graduate school. You start with small particles. They s bump into each other. They stick. Those little particles then bump into other little, somewhat larger particles. And it goes on and on, a cascade of ever larger particles bumping and sticking. And ultimately, gravity takes over. And it just keeps on going. It's, and it's a hierarchy. It's a, it's a ladder of accretion. But as this goes on, the velocities between the particles continue to increase and increase, and things become more and more violent. And uh, so we call this high velocity hierarchical accretion. And the, the speeds between the uh, accreting world lits, if you like, uh, go hundreds of meters per second or, uh, or even more. In the last few years, or actually I suppose in the last 15 to 20 years, there's been a, com a new, a completely new idea, theoretical idea about how things formed in the old solar, si the ancient solar system. And these, this idea was basically designed to overcome some of the theoretical deficiencies in hierarchical accretion. And it basically goes back to the solar nebula or disk and appeals to collective what I would call aerodynamic instabilities between these ensembles of small particles and gas. And the, in fact, we even charmingly call the small particles pebbles to make it even more romantic. But the idea is that when you have enough of these particles together, they interact with the gas in such a way uh, with, through gas drag that they begin to collect into great streams. And, and so the, Hence, we use this word called the streaming instability. That's inside the, the rotating gas and, and the pebble or particle disk. But when the density of the particles becomes great enough compared to the gas density, then the streams fragment. They fragment into individual clouds of particles. And that you can see in the bottom row in the sort of moving into the center there where the arrows are pointing in. And what's happening there is that those this individual cloud of particles is now all the particles are falling towards the center. And whoop, almost on an, in an astronomically uh, sort of instantaneous, but not instantaneous to us, time, they make a big planetesimal. And uh, when I say big, all at once, they make a big planetesimal, I mean 10, 20, 30, maybe 100 kilometers across. But what's more interesting is that when we do computer simulations of this process, the cloud is never completely symmetric. There's always some sense of rotation. There's always some angular momentum, a sense of spin or swirl. So as the things come down together, you more often than not don't just make a single unibody or a single body, but you make a binary. And that binary may be orbiting, like in the se uh, second, the penultimate uh, little frame at the bottom, or it may actually be a contact binary, uh, like actually we see at Arrowcock. Now these are, this is a theory, and it's well supported you know, by analytical, you know, mathematics and computer models, but wouldn't it be great to actually see a planetesimal and see and test out these ideas? And that's where Arrowcoth comes in, because just like Alan said, the Kuiper Belt, and in particular this region we call the cold classical region of the Kuiper Belt, which is even beyond Pluto, it's a very quiet and gentle sort of attic for, for objects to live. The worlds that are there form there, and they've been basically unperturbed since the beginning of the solar system. So, of course, when we look at Arrokoth, you see the two lobes that Alan described, and you see that in detail, they're just touching each other. It's like they're kissing, or if they were spacecraft, they'd be docking, okay? There's no evidence that the merger of these two lobes 
was at all violent. There's no uh, evidence for any kind of catastrophic disruption or reassembly. Now, one of the things my colleagues and I, we did in, in the paper that I led is we said, well, let's, let's examine this a little bit more quantitatively. So we say, well, what are the velocity limits that actually will r result in this kind of merger? And so we did a, our um, co-authors, uh, Derek Richardson and uh, Julian Moronic at the uh, University of Maryland, uh, they ran state-of-the-art uh, numerical computer models of, uh, of basically interacting uh, bodies, of uh, uh, granular bodies that are striking each other at a, at a variety of, of uh, angles and speeds. And we had have done a whole suite of calculations of which we put some in the paper. And what it shows is if you actually take bodies the size and scale of the two lobes of Erikoth and you apply the right or what we think of are the correct um, mechanical and, uh, and physical parameters to the bodies that any kind of really large velocity will just, well, they won't stick to each other and in fact, they'll smash each other to bits. So the one on the left is a very modest speed of 10 meters a second. Now you can see like 22 miles an hour. So the bodies don't, don't merge. Even if the bodies are just coming, uh, colliding at their own mutual escape speed, they get too smushed. That's the, 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 the figure in, in the middle. So the only way to make, to account for this truly gently merged binary is if the merger speed was very low, certainly no more than a few meters a second, and probably less, honestly, I think a meter a second and, and obliquely. So um, it, otherwise, it, it cannot explain what we see at Erikoth. So for me to sum up, the conclusion is that the this is what a planetesimal looks like, or at least this planetesimal, and the shape, its appearance, if you like, its geology, is simply absolutely inconsistent with any kind of higher velocity, hierarchical accretion. But it does match what we expect to see in the low velocity merger or assembly of bodies in the sort of local cloud in the solar nebula, a collapsing cloud of particles and pebbles. And that's not the only bit of evidence. The cartoon, or not the, the, the graphic I just showed you that had the colliding objects, I color coded them green and blue for clarity. Th those are not its real colors, okay? <laughs> but color is an important part of this story, and that's what Will is going to talk about. Okay. So, uh, so like Bill was saying, um, in the hierarchical accretion scenario, especially the late stages, um, as bigger and bigger chunks are coming together, um, they're coming in at pretty high speeds, uh, considerably higher than the 10 meters per second that, that he showed in his disruptive um, uh, time step uh, from the models. Um, they're also coming in from quite a ways afield just because of these higher speeds. Um, and it also takes a long time to assemble a planetesimal this way. Um, and uh, the nebula can change its composition on timescales of the same time scale as it takes to build a planetesimal, something like 100,000 years. Um, in contrast, the, um, the uh, gravitational collapse is quite sudden. It's uh, maybe of the order of a decade kind of time scale. And it's only drawing in material from the very local region. And uh, so in a binary, you would expect that forms through that mechanism, it's drawing basically local, locally sourced materials all at once. You'd expect it to look more or less homogeneous. And the colors, um, this is the highest resolution color image uh, that we got with New Horizons, about 340 meter per pixel scale. Um, it just shows that the the two lobes are essentially the same color. Um, we call it red, which really just means that it's uh, more reflective at longer wavelengths. Um, uh, uh, you know, don't expect the you know red paint kind of color here. But um, it's uh, the the variations in color across the surface are very small. Um, you do see variations in the absolute reflectance, the albedo across the surface, but the color variation is is pretty subtle. Um, if you go to the near-infrared, this is a wavelength region that is extremely valuable for solar system exploration because a lot of the key planet-building materials have characteristic absorption bands here. And this looks like a black and white image. Um, 
but that's fooling you. It's not. It's, it's, a, it's a false color image composed of three different infrared wavelengths. And if you did this with Pluto, it would look amazingly colorful. Pluto had a very uh, heterogeneous surface with a lot of materials with distinctive absorption features. And this looks really bland, uh, entirely homogeneous and, and consistent with our expectation from um, uh, a very sudden assembly from local materials that are all well mixed. Um, and, and there's other lines of evidence as well, um, which I'll, I'll hand off to John to tell you about more morphological uh, observations. Um, yes, so uh, we, we took a lot of images of Arakov as we flew past it, uh, looking at it from different angles. So we got a pretty good idea of its, uh, its three-dimensional shape, and that is also telling us a very consistent story. Um, these are, this is a little bit of uh, trickery in the computer of taking two separate images and then uh, merging between them so you can get some idea of the three-dimensional shape of the object as if you were rocking backwards and forwards in your viewpoint of it. And um, we take these two images to make stereo, which gives us the three-dimensional shape of this uh, side of Arakov. But we also look at a lot of other images that we took on approach, even some looking back uh, after the flyby where we see the night side silhouetted against the stars. And so we can build up from that a nice uh, three-dimensional model of, of the shape of the object, of the two, the two lobes of the object. And um, the first thing that's clear is that these are two objects are quite flattened. They're kind of like little M&Ms or something like that. Um, but most strikingly, those two uh, lobes are beautifully aligned with each other. Uh, the blue line is the, uh, on the larger one, and the, uh, the green line in the middle of the smaller one are their equators. They're almost perfectly li lined up with each other. Their poles are pointing in pretty much the same direction. The smaller one is a little bit elongated, and the direction in which it's elongated is pointing almost perfectly at the larger lobe. And so this is telling us that these objects uh, spent enough time in orbit around each other that they were able, their tides, their mutual gravity was able to align them like this. And then, as Bill talked about, they gradually spiraled in and, and touched to form the object we see today. But this is telling us that, yes, these really were not two things just randomly blundering into each other, but they formed in the same cloud in mutual orbit and, uh, and then came together in this very gentle way. And uh, so this is all giving us this uh, very consistent picture of how this object was built. And now I will hand it back to Alan to summarize. Okay, thank you, John. We'll take the next slide, yeah. So uh, let, me put, let me put a cap on this a couple of different ways. Uh, we built and flew New Horizons to the Kuiper Belt to learn about the Kuiper Belt, Kuiper Belt objects, and with the hope that we could learn about uh, the origin of planet formation. And Erikoff truly delivered. It is a wonderful scientific present. And uh, the results that have just been described to you are, in my view, watershed. Now, for decades, as Bill described, there have been two competing models for how these first stages of planet formation took place, uh, the hierarchical accretion model and uh, the local cloud collapse or pebble cloud collapse models. Uh, and Erikoff has provided a decisive test between the two. Uh, in fact, as you see in the, um, the little scorecard in the lower left, um, every one of these half dozen attributes that we've been talking to you about line up for the cloud collapse model. And we, uh, as a team, uh, cannot imagine how higher archaeal accretion could have created the Erikoff that we see. And by inference, if we pull the typical Kuiper belt object out of the bag, this is ha how planetesimal formation took place across the Kuiper belt and very possibly across the solar system. And I'm going to close by making a bit of an analogy. In the 1940s and 50s, there were multiple theories of the origin of the universe, of cosmology. There was the Big Bang. There was steady state. Uh, there was constant creation. And the theorists in, in analogy to the way that planetary science has been trying to understand planetesimal formation, the theorists were working uh, computationally and theoretically 
uh, but could not resolve which model was correct. And then in the mid-1960s, the cosmic microwave background was discovered, and that uh, decisive test could only be explained by Big Bang. And the other two theories fell away, and the Big Bang became paradigm and has continued to pass test after test. Uh, the evidence that we have for uh, local cloud collapse for the formation of this primordial object, the first primordial object ever explored by spacecraft called Erkov, is uh, similarly decisive for planetary origins. And uh, we think we now know, as a result of New Horizons and the exploration of Erkov, how those first stages of planet formation took place how planetesimals formed, um, and its cloud collapse. Uh, and uh, we're really looking forward to answering your questions about this and uh, really very excited about this result that New Horizons has obtained. Okay, we'll start the Q&A. Please raise your hand. A mic will be brought to you. Kindly state your name and affiliation before your question. Okay, we'll start here. Um, Palab Ghosh from BBC News. Alan, could I ask you to explain to a general news audience. You said that um, this was the results were beyond your wildest dreams. Could you explain whether this is a game changer? How significant is this discovery? What does this do to the current theory of planet formation? This, I believe this is a game changer because it allows us to distinguish between those competing models and, and as you, as you saw, the evidence all points to the cloud collapse or streaming instability models and uh, is not consistent with the hierarchical accretion, high velocity accretion uh, that Bill spoke to you about. So as I said, it's a watershed moment for planetary science because we now have, for the first time, um, a truly primordial object and it did not produce an ambiguous result. And that is the, the wonderful surprise, is that it's a decisive result in favor of one theory, local cloud collapse, and uh, inconsistent with the formation of Erkov by hierarchical accretion. So what does it do to that established theory? I think it makes it the paradigm. So the, the one that hierarchical accretion. The, no, the, the hierarchical accretion um, uh, is, is, cannot explain what we found and the local cloud collapse or streaming instability models become the paradigm. I'm psychologically <laughs> We're pretty excited. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think it's going to take uh, some additional work, uh, particularly uh, we'd like to see new missions back to the Kuiper Belt um, to see uh, uh, the range of, of bodies in the Kuiper Belt and to add greater weight to this first sample but it is quite decisive, and I think that um, in our community, it's going to be viewed as, I said, a watershed moment for uh, the local cloud collapse models. Question in the second row uh, here in the checkered shirt. And then we'll go there. Hi. Uh, <coughs> it takes well, should be on here. Hi, Sid Perkins, freelance. <coughs> uh, for anybody, I was wondering if there's anything about the object that lets you uh, estimate when in the history of the solar system this collapse occurred? I mean, the, the tip to tip seems like a relatively unstable situation, but then you've got the neck and the, the size and shape of the neck that may have argued for a long history of contact. Can anybody have uh, oh, any I'll, sort of estimate? I'll, I'll say a few things. So the, uh, actually, that orientation or the, where they're lined up is actually the stable situation. And if the cloud collapse idea is right, it has to, you need gas around, and we know that the, the gas in the solar nebula only lasted a few million years after the formation of the initial solar disk and, and protosun. Um, so it happened very early, and by looking also at the craters on top of, uh, you've seen the pictures? Well, it, it used to be there, and it's, it's not very cratered, and you might think it, the object is young, but it's, if you actually do the estimates of how fast things accrete, onto uh, Arakoth, uh, and we published a paper before the encounter. Uh, we pointed out that the cratering rate is so low that even a low, the number of craters we see is consistent with a four and a half billion year old age. I think we had a question here in the second row and then we'll come to the third, uh, or first row, sorry. 
Robin Williams, ABC Australia. How confident are you that the conditions in the Kuiper Belt, with all those small pebbles and such like, were quite different from the gigantic forces in the middle of the solar system with that huge star and more likely bigger planets forming? How confident are you you can separate the two? Well, I can speak that a little, and maybe Bill will okay. add to that. But um, uh, there are a couple of factors that I should point out. The first is that uh, this stage of, of uh, planetesimal formation, the first few million years, um, may have even been before the giant planets really became massive. Moreover, if, if the disk was still around, as predicted by uh, uh, the local cloud collapse models, um, we know that the disk is um, optically thick, and therefore, uh, because it, it's like a cloudy day where you can't see the sun, um, uh, everywhere in the nebula, uh, uh, conditions were more like in the Kuiper belt than they would be today once the disk cleared. Um, so an important question going forward will be um, how representative of the closer regions of the solar system is the Kuiper belt for uh, this formation mechanism. The theoretical underpinnings indicate that it should operate broadly. Um, but we want to test that with, uh, with future measurements. Bill? Yeah, I'll, I'll just amplify that. The, um, we don't have any reason to suspect that the, the basic physics within the, the, of the particles, the pebbles, and the gas changes as you go in towards the sun. Um, uh, one of the things that the cloud collapse uh, idea, the streaming instability followed by gravitational instability for, uh, forming, big planetesimals all at once, it jump starts planet formation. It speeds things up enormously, and there's still pebbles around. And in fact, it's always been a problem as to how do you build Jupiter fast enough. We have uh, other lines of evidence that tell us that Jupiter formed within about a million years. So you have to make a sort of an enormous sort of super planet, and then it has to suck in all the gas from the, s from the, from the solar disk. And uh, this, this scenario with then pebbles themselves piling on to a planetesimal seed is actually uh, w maybe the leading idea now for how Jupiter formed. So there's a whole lot of work going on uh, in, in, that, in, in that arena. Could I make one point on that? Yeah. Um, so it's certainly true that the conditions vary as a function of heliocentric distance. And in general, things are denser and happen faster closer to the sun. Of course, the, the proper way to test this is to go look at a pristine planetesimal that was made in a different location. Unfortunately, the planetesimals that are left in the asteroid belt are really pretty battered, and it's hard to tell what their original shapes were. But there are two places that you could look for planetesimals that formed closer to the sun than Arakoth. And one is the Trojan swarms of the various giant planets. And NASA's Lucy mission is going to launch next year to go explore some Jupiter Trojans. And the other is uh, there was a disk of planetesimals that was originally outside of Neptune, and Neptune kicked them around into the excited part of the Kuiper belt. And New Horizons is flying through that zone now. If we get lucky, we could have a flyby of one of these more excited planetesimals that formed closer to the sun than Arakoth did. And that would be really helpful to see how far we can extrapolate inward. And the, another part of that chain is that some of those excited objects are the ones that eventually became comets that came back in towards the sun. And so we're very interested in comets as being uh, uh, messengers from, from this part of the solar system. And comets, have, as Alan showed, are very evolved and their surfaces are very altered by the, the, the heat of the sun and all the evaporation that's happened. So it's a, it's a harder story to unravel on the comets, but we're certainly working on that and the comets are providing clues. Question in the third row and then we'll have one in the back. Yeah. Nicolas Bustamante from El Tiempo, Colombian newspaper El Tiempo. Mm. This, well, first of all, con congratulations. And this answers many questions about the solar system for formation, but what new new questions do you have and do you think you're going to answer with this mission, especially with Arcoth and New Horizons? Do you want to split that between us? You okay. You could, could well, you, you know, I... At the end of the question. Yeah, so I'll say, you know, we're, you know, uh, we're still getting data down from the spacecraft. Uh, we've gotten maybe most of the uh, 
the juicy bits. Uh, <laughs> but one of the things that I think will this really focuses a kind of theoretical attention on this new on the evo newer evolving paradigm of planetesimal formation. And so I, I think we're going to see increasingly sophisticated uh, computer simulations starting from the solar gas and particle disk all the way down to the formation of bodies, just like you see on the slide. So that sort of soup to nuts simulation has not been done, but I'm looking forward to that. Right. Yeah, um, I, oh. I'm sorry, John, go ahead. Um, um, another thing we're doing is we're, we're still in the Kuiper Belt with the spacecraft. We're still taking new data, and we're, we're looking at a couple of dozen uh, other objects in the Kuiper Belt, which are much more distant. They're millions of miles away, and we just see them as points of light. But by looking at these objects from much closer than we can from the Earth, uh, we're getting more of a feel for how typical uh, Arakoth is in terms of its shape, the way it scatters light. Um, and so we're gathering that additional data to provide context for what we're getting from, from Arakoth and uh, starting to see how typical it really is. Yeah, and I'll just elaborate on that. That was a perfect intro to uh, what I wanted to tell you, which is that we've now secured time on large ground-based telescopes to search for uh, small Kuiper Belt objects, new ones, along our pathway um, as the spacecraft moves further outward. And uh, we expect from our, our model predictions that we will discover dozens of objects to add to that sample that John just spoke to you about of 15 or so that we've looked at so far. So we'll have a, a really significant, statistically important sample um, of these objects. In addition, as a part of this mission, um, uh, our co-investigator, Dr. Mark Bowie, developed a technique for imaging small Kuiper belt object shapes called stellar occultations. He took it to the next, the next order of magnitude level of precision. And as a result, uh, ground-based uh, observations of Kuiper belt object shapes um, uh, can also now be imaged, like the silhouette of Erkoth that we imaged before we got there, um, again, to tell us how typical this contact binary uh, scenario is. Uh, and then, uh, from the standpoint of New Horizons, um, as Will was speaking to, uh, we have fuel left in the tank, the spacecraft is healthy, it has power to run for 15 years. Our greatest ambition is to find another Kuiper Belt object that we could fly by. Uh, it took us four years and many attempts with ground-based telescopes to find Arakoth, uh, but we persisted and the results have been spectacular. And the searches for uh, new flyby targets begin this summer on telescope time that's already been secured on the largest telescopes in the world. Uh, and uh, although we have very little fuel left, um, we're going to look under every rock, so to speak, to try to get another flyby if we possibly can. I think in the end, uh, we will need new missions to the Kuiper Belt. Uh, and fortunately, the, the next decadal survey is just about to begin to lay out priorities for the 2020s and 2030s. It will begin this summer and report out in two years' time. So uh, we're, it's fortuitous that this discovery was made uh, now, just before a decadal survey, because I expect it will influence the discussions uh, in that process for what missions go next. Yeah, and I'll just add a tiny extra bit. The next 10 years, we'll also see uh, all sorts of new data from uh, new telescopes here on, on the Earth. The, we'll be taking deeper surveys of the Kuiper Belt with the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, which is under construction in Chile. And uh, then there's the extremely large telescope, a huge uh, uh, <laughs> mirror, basically, down also under construction in Chile. We'll be able to probe ever deeper into uh, determining the character of, of distant Kuiper Belt objects, determining whether they're binaries. And then the, there's the launch of the James Webb Space Telescope in a, in within a couple of years that will also be able to tell us about their compositions in ever greater detail. So it's going to be a quite interesting uh, time in the future. Question in the back, and then we'll come over here. <coughs> Hi, I'm Alan Boyle with GeekWire. I just had a couple of follow-up questions. One was uh, the hierarchical uh, accretion versus cloud collapse. Are you saying that cloud collapse explains everything? I, I suspect that you would say that at a certain scale, there is a hierarchical accretion scenario that might, might kick in. Uh, and then the other question, kind of following up on what Alan was saying, was the, the timing for trying to identify and select a new target. I think it 
one point, uh, you folks were saying that it would take until perhaps early 2021 to get the data down from the Arakot encounter, encounter, and perhaps by that time you would have a target and identified. Do you have an, a, a better sense of what the timing might be? Yeah, I'll, I'll speak to your second question first, and then I'll hand it to Bill to talk about your first question. And anybody else that wants to chip in, feel free. So, uh, Alan, I, I need to update you and the audience on how we're going to go about looking for uh, targets for a New Horizons to observe, both in the distance and to search for potential flyby targets. For a time, we thought that the best way to do it was with the telescope on the spacecraft. Um, but after more detailed study, we actually found that uh, that had enough roadblocks, technical roadblocks, that it's better to do it from the Earth with large telescopes on the ground than a very small telescope in the Kuiper Belt that can only report data back at very slow rates. Um, basically, the, the, the number of images that you have to make conspire uh, to make that less favored doing it from the spacecraft from the ground. So we're going to search from the ground, or possibly with the Hubble. Um, and uh, those searches, uh, as I said, begin this summer. They can only be done in the summertime, really, uh, because currently the direction of travel for New Horizons at this time in February is in the daytime sky. You can't use your telescopes to search there. So beginning in April and then lasting through the summer and into s the September time frame is the optimum time when that part of the sky is available at night for large ground-based telescopes to search. And uh, we expect to conduct those searches uh, this year and next year as a minimum. And we'll see what we have at that point. Yeah, so and getting to your early question, uh, you, you are right. Once we jumpstart the planetesimal process, there's kind of a branching. You could then start hierarchical accretion with those planetesimals, or you could have what I was just referring to to the other question. You could have now what was we call pebble accretion on top of those planetesimals. So planetesimals are not only the building blocks of planets, they can also be the seeds of planetary growth. And certainly at the end stage, when we have larger bodies, then gravity is very powerful, and we expect to have collisions between major bodies. That's how we form the Earth's moon, how we form Pluto's moon, Charon, that kind of thing. And it's not just the end stage. Remember, you're starting at micron-sized dust, building your way up to planets, and from micron-sized dust to the pebbles that we're talking about for this cloud collapse, it's a bunch of orders of magnitude, and that is hierarchical accretion of just dust particles adding to one another. That there's always been a problem with hierarchical accretion, that getting from those pebble-sized things to yeah, things the size of Arakoth is really hard because they're hitting each other fast enough they should be smashing each other up and not building together. And so we found the way around that, both with the theories and now very dramatically with the direct evidence of how you build things that size. And once they're that big, then you can start smashing them together and building them larger. We have time for one more question over here. Thanks, Clive Cookson from the FT in London. Um, a couple of quick questions prompted by David Jewett's perspectives piece. He ends by advocating a sort of body hopping Kuiper belt exploration or um, planning a mission, which I guess would be in mid 21st century to explore the Kuiper belt in a different way rather than the sort of hit and run flybys. What do you think of the prospects of that? And then a very specific question. He uses the phrase ultra red for the color, which I think is misleading for a lay um, readership because it's not ultra red in any meaningful sense. What is ultra red? <laughs> right. Well, so Will, you want to take the color part? I'll do the color part, and then I'll hand off to you. Um, yeah, so. Uh, a bunch of people, including him and, and Scott Shepard and others, have looked at which are the reddest objects out there. And, and Arakoth and the Cold Classicals are not actually the reddest of the red. There are a few that are even redder. But you're entirely right. This is really a description of the slope when you plot the colors on a, on a plot of reflectance versus wavelength. Yeah. These are, it's more a reddish brown yeah, scarlet. Yeah, the way the human eye would perceive it would be very dark brown, and they would all look pretty much dark brown. Various shades of dark brown. So speaking to the, the question of Kuiper Belt exploration, let me first emphasize that the Kuiper Belt is truly vast. The surface area of the Kuiper Belt, that disk around uh, uh, the middle solar, the, the outer, you know, that surrounds the middle solar system, 
um, is almost an order of magnitude larger than everything from Neptune to the sun in, in surface area. So this is a vast territory teeming with countless Kuiper Belt objects, of which Erkoth is, is, a, is a prime example, but also teeming with small planets like Pluto. And in the scientific community, since the, uh, uh, the results of New Horizons, there have been those who want to go back to Pluto, as we do, and to orbit it and study it in more detail with other kinds of instrumentation and stay there long enough to observe time changes on this very dynamic world, to study its satellites and so forth. Um, that's kind of the go deep approach. Then there have been advocates for missions that instead survey a wide variety of uh, mm -hmm. small planets and small Kuiper Belt objects like Erkoth and give us the diversity of the Kuiper Belt. Uh, and those two forces um, have been debating each other, waiting for this decadal survey, but I will point out that at uh, my institution, the Southwest Research Institute, we conducted a study which is now um, uh, uh, working its way through publication, in which we found that a single mission can do both those things using electric propulsion technology that's been demonstrated with missions like NASA's Dawn mission, that you can go to Pluto, orbit, and then leave Pluto and go back out into the Kuiper Belt all with the same spacecraft and do more exploration. And that you can even get into orbit around at least one more dwarf planet with that technology that already exists. Now, there are some development issues, but not with the propulsion technology. Um, but we now think that we can have our cake and eat it too. Uh, that would be a very exciting mission to the Kuiper Belt. And in the lead up to the decadal survey, it's about to begin, NASA has now funded 11 studies of different missions around the solar system um, so that the technical details are ready for the decadal survey to consider. And one of those is precisely this mission to travel to Pluto, enter orbit in the Pluto system, and then after a few years break orbit and move on into the Kuiper belt to study the diversity of objects there. And that study um, uh, is being led by uh, a member of the New Horizons team, Dr. Carly Howitt, as principal investigator. Thanks, everybody. If you have more questions for our speakers, uh, we are going to go over to room 208 right now. I'll be walking there and, and taking them with me. They've graciously agreed we can continue. But thank you so much for your time, everyone. That was very insightful. Thank you.